Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I gotta give him a few seconds to get everything turned on back there and ready. So when you witness a baptism, it's even greater when you get to witness two baptisms. What you witness is a soul passing from death to life. For Paul made it plain that Watch the lapel mic. In my pocket. <laughs> Is it on mute? And it's on mute. Okay. That doesn't work. And that doesn't work. How's that? That's that better. Work. <laughs> Turn it down a little bit. I just saw a picture in uh, it was either Southern Tidings or Adventist Review. It was the last picture of Ellen White as she was giving a public speaking engagement. So she was she's preaching, the last public preaching engagement she gave before she died. And you look at that picture, and it was taken from the audience, uh, the camera pointing to the stage, and there was a lot of people there. Now you think about it. She was outside, a lot of people, and they had no microphones. And they said that they could hear her clearly from the front row to the back row. She knew how to speak publicly. What we witnessed this morning is two souls passing from death unto life. Amen. Paul said that the wages of sin is what? Amen. But the gift of God is Amen. eternal life. So when we give our hearts to Jesus Christ, we too pass from death unto life. And the greatest thing about that is that in this life, you will be born and you will die. If Jesus doesn't come before, one of those, or both those things will happen to you. It's guaranteed. Guaranteed for everybody. Death is the power of sin. If you sin, what you're going to be paid is death. How you pass from that is by giving your heart to Jesus Christ and He, at that moment, gives you life eternal. Amen. And He made a statement that sounds really strange. He says, you will never die. Amen. But yet I told you everybody here will die if He does not come. How can that be? Because the death He was talking about is eternal death. Finally. And that's what He came to give you victory over. Amen. So you see, when the Bible talks about death as a sleep, it's for your comfort and my comfort. Amen. Because those of us who know what it's like to see a loved one be laid to rest and feel that loss, we also know that in Christ we will see them again. Amen. And that it will be a very short period of time. Just a season. A season. Listen, brothers and sisters, this is what God has given you. He's given you a season of life. For some of us, it's a long season. It's a good season. For some of us, it's a short season. But nobody knows how long God will give you. This is why the Bible says that today is the day of salvation. There may be those here who have been putting off your decision to give everything you are to Jesus Christ. Now listen, I went through the investigative judgment this morning. In a Seventh-day Adventist, do you believe in the investigative judgment? Do you believe that's actually taking place? Does it scare you? It shouldn't. It should give you courage and it should give you assurance. Let me ask you a question. When you confess your sins, the Bible says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to do what? <laughs> to forgive us our sins. When you confess your sins, what happens to them? Do they just like magically disappear? They get taken to the sanctuary. What happens, right? They go to the sanctuary. So see, where's Jesus at now? Okay, see now, we ask most people that, I say, well, He's in heaven. What's he doing there? Well, you know, Revelation said he's been building a city. Because, you know, he wasn't carpenter. 
Okay. Okay. Come on. Come on. But I want you to think about this. How long has it been since he left this earth to our day today? Two thousand years. Man, you could build a tremendous city in two thousand years, right? But did Jesus really need to build it with his hands? He spoke the universe into existence. He could speak a city into existence, and that's nothing, right? So, what's he been doing in heaven for 2,000 years? What's it, high priest? Well, if you read Hebrews, or if you read Daniel 8 and 9, you realize that, well, he's been working for our salvation. Hebrews tells us it makes it plain that Jesus is our high priest. Is that right? Yeah. And over and over again, the book of Hebrews centers on that fact that Jesus is our high priest. But what does a high priest do? And not only does it say he's our high priest, it says he's a better high priest than the earthly high priests. Do you know why? Right? The blood that he uses atones permanently. What earthly high priest shed their own blood to cleanse Israel from their sins? Not one. Right? But this high priest gave his own blood, divine blood, to wash away your sins. And in washing away those sins, he made atonement. You know what that word means? Atonement? At one minute? Meaning that outside of Jesus Christ, this is you and this is God, and there is a huge wall and barrier between you and Him. God never wanted it that way. It's our choice. Mm. Understand that? Yeah. We didn't, God didn't build the wall. <coughs> we built the wall. Right. Through our actions and our sin. Sin will separate you from your God. Always remember that. Those of you who call on the name of Christ know and realize that <coughs> sin will separate you from God. And God does not take sin lightly. It costs the death of His Son. Amen. But aren't you glad that if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father? Amen. And that if you confess your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Amen. Right? Amen. Now listen. We have passed from death unto life. What Christ has given us and the hope that we have that should burn in your hearts and should allow you to go through whatever this world throws at you is the hope that that's not going to be permanent. And that's not the way it's always going to be. But what Christ has given you is a season. He went through a season of pain. And if you're going to follow Him, you too will go through a season of pain. Each of us here has one thing in common, and that is we all know pain. Right? If you have seen loved ones pass from this life to the sleep of death, you know that pain of separation and sorrow. But in Christ, you realize that it's only for a short period of time. And that the life that they had, not only will they get again, but they'll get it again without any disease, without any sickness, without any suffering, and without any more pain. Amen. So listen, this life is the only hell Christians will ever know. Amen. 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 For those that don't know Jesus, this life is the only heaven they'll ever know. Amen. Jesus gives you the freedom to make the choice of who you will choose to follow. Let me tell you something. If this life is the only heaven you ever want to know, you're selling yourself cheap. And I mean cheap. Amen. Now, you think about the life of Paul. Did Paul know what it was like to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ? Yes. Yes. Right, Paul. Outside of Jesus himself, Paul probably had one of the roughest walks as a Christian and as a follower of the true God. But yet Paul was able to say, and he wrote it down for history, that these light and momentary afflictions, 
light and momentary afflictions that we suffer are nothing compared to the glory that's in store for us when Jesus comes back. Amen. See, we know the afflictions, and we know that sometimes they're not light nor are they momentary. But what we don't know is Jesus Christ. Because Paul was able to say, you can kill me. You can take this life. You can put me through misery, but yet I'll still have joy. You can okay. cause me physical pain, but my heart will still sing because I know who my Savior is. You can take all of my earthly gain. You can take away my house, my food, my money, everything. But I know who I am in Jesus Christ. And that will never change. Amen? Amen. Amen. Sure about that? Amen. Amen. Listen, what, what gives you hope? Is it your bank account? No. no. Better not be because uh, you see the way everything's heading. And if, you're, if your hope is in your stocks and your bonds, well, you had a really rough week. Amen. <laughs> If your hope is in your political system, whew, they lie to you. Post office. And they'll continue to lie to you. They have an agenda. And their agenda and Satan's agenda is the same agenda. God's people are not known by their political affiliation. They're not known by their national affiliation. They're known by the love that they have for one another. Amen. Amen. Jesus Christ has done so much for you that you could be living in the pit of despair and still have joy and happiness. Amen. Because that's what he gives. Did you listen to that song that Charles Huggerbrook sang? Ooh. His eyes on the sparrow. I think that song specifically because my mother-in-law came to our church, and she saw him. Is that right? And I never knew this, but that was like her favorite song, and he sung it. And so when he came here last week, and he was selling the CDs at the end of Vespers, I looked for that one, and that's like his first CD. That, that CD is as old as my daughter is. Okay? Because that song meant a lot to her, and I never heard that song before that time. And I started listening to it and really listening to the words and I saw how much joy it brought her and it was able to touch my heart. Patty, this is the difference between a preacher and a musician. What it takes you three or four minutes to convey will take me 45. To get the depth of a mo there she is, hi, can you hear me? Because I'm talking about you. <laughs> What you can do, oh, she disappeared. She's out. <coughs> what you can do in a four minute song, and the emotions that you can bring up, and the fact that you can bring people right to the very throne of God, it take me at least a half an hour to get, to get you there. You know what I'm saying? Just by speaking words. It's the foolishness of preaching. I had told Charles when he came last week that. It was his music, and specifically music on that CD that Gary has in the back, that helped me through a very rough time in my relationship with the church. Not with God, but with the church. My wife and I, we joined the church. We both were baptized, just like you saw this morning. We were in a tub at the same time, and my mother was there, so you had three people in a tub at one time. My wife and I were baptized at the same time, and we came up. We studied together. It's kind of funny because I can remember her telling me, I will go to any church, but I don't want to go to a church where they tell you you can't wear pants. <laughs> <laughs> now, you older Adventists, you know what I'm talking about. Because the church we came to, that was that church. Do you know what? She came. And she was baptized. And I can remember sitting in a, uh, a Revelation seminar with my mom. And they gave the study on tithing. She had no problems with any other study. But the one on tithing, I'm sitting next to her and I can feel her body heat. And, like, oh, and I look at her, her ears are red. Her ears are red. But you need to understand, 
When you present the gospel to people, this church requires something from you. When you make a commitment to follow Jesus Christ and the message of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we don't want you just to come in and go home and never be changed. We expect something from you. We expect Jesus to be lived out in your life. We expect you to follow His Word according to what it says, not by what I say, but by what the Word says. And we'll hold you to that standard, the Word of God. Is tithing a biblical standard? Yes. Was it just for the Old Testament people? No. Is tithing a New Testament standard? No. Yes. Yes. yes, yes it is. If it wasn't, the Adventist Church wouldn't teach it. Okay? But we teach it, and we'll hold you to it. Why? Because... Two things that God has given humanity to keep you from selfishness. The first and greatest is children. <laughs> the second is tithing. Because tithing helps you to realize it's not yours. It's His. And He's so gracious that, now you tell me, who else gives you 90% and only wants 10%? And your government wants 40 or more. You know what I'm saying? God says 10. Just 10. You can have the other number. But it's all mine. But I give you this. Okay? So, after that lesson, my mother didn't say nothing. And it took probably a week. A week of sitting with her at her house and just broaching this subject. Because what happened is, we used to go to the uh, Catholic Church. And they would have a fun drive every year. Now, my mother was a single parent raising four kids in the 60s. And she didn't have the money to give to their fund drive. And they put her name in the bulletin. Oh. Yes? Oh. And she saw it there. And that was the last day she went into the doors of that church. So we moved down here. And she would take us to church and drop us off. And we would go. And she'd tell us when she dropped us off, I don't receive no phone calls. Because you have a scene trouble. And so you should get a phone call. And then you come home. And then you'll know what trouble is. So we were very good in church. Now, have you ever sat through a Catholic Mass in like the early, late 60s, early 70s, when it was still in Latin? Now, I had trouble sitting still. Just, just, just. Now, you stick me there, and I had to sit on my hands. And I did, I sat on my hands. But I knew the routine of the church. As soon as they did communion, that's great, because everything was over after that. So if I could be good until that time, everything was good. But when we became teenagers, and we all went our separate ways, my mother started going back to the Catholic Church. And she would go back every day, and she would light a candle for each one of her kids. And she would say a prayer that God would save them from the choices that they were making at that time in their lives. And every day, she would go. And every day she would pray. And God heard her prayers and God saved all four of her children. Amen. This God we serve is a tremendous, tremendous God. Amen. We use this word awesome today for everything. You know what I'm saying? The cars are awesome. Chocolate cake is awesome. <laughs> but the Bible uses the word awesome for God. And God is the true definition of what awesome is. Because He is an awesome God. God has taken all the riches of heaven. All the riches of heaven. Now think about if Bill Gates took everything he had and everything he owned and he gave it to you. Wouldn't that be great? Would you be happy? Would you do anything you could to make Bill Gates happy if he did that for you? Right? Well, think about that. The riches that God poured out on us and His Son, Jesus Christ, is nothing. Bill Gates has nothing to even compare to that. God took all of heaven, poured it into His Son, made Him a baby, brought Him to this earth, the best gift that was ever given to humanity. And in Jesus Christ, all heaven is poured out on you and me. We have all the riches of heaven now. Now. Is that right? Amen. We didn't have now listen, the problem is, let's face it, some of us don't want those kind of riches. I want a full bank account. I want my mortgage paid off. 
I want my car loans paid off. And the riches that God gives is a little bit different than that. Is that right? Yeah. But you know what I found? God does pay off my mortgage. God does pay off my car. God gives me the ability to make income. Yes. And share that income. But that is nothing compared to what I have found and experienced in Jesus Christ. Because brothers and sisters, as I told you, what we have in common here is we all know pain. Right? We all know pain. We all know sadness and depression. Now, I would say we all know happiness as well, but I've met some people that they, they, they don't look like they ever had a happy day in their life. <laughs> They've had at least one. I'm saying. <laughs> Have you ever met those people? Oh, yeah. Have you ever worked for those people? Yeah. Very bad. Anyway, Jesus didn't come to save you from fear. Jesus came to experience fear so that he would know what it's like, so that you could trust him when you are afraid. Mm. Jesus didn't come to take away your pain. Jesus came to experience pain, so that when you're going through the pain, you can trust him to carry you through it. Amen. Now listen, if we had never sinned, then we would never need to know what pain is. We would never need to know what sorrow is. But because we have this sinful, broken nature to come to God and want to thirst after Him. The Bible doesn't say, seek God with half of your heart. The Bible doesn't say, seek God with a quarter of your heart. What does the Bible say? All of your heart. A hundred percent. Is that right? Yeah. But the problem is, is we'll say, well, half of it, yeah, that's cool. I can give God half of it, and then the other half's mine. I can do it, it what I want. Because, you know, I've got a family to feed, I've got a business to run, and I want to make a name for myself before I die. Right? Right? Now, let me ask you a question. Do you not think that happens with people that work within the denomination? Yes. Okay, you don't, you don't think people within the denomination want to climb that ladder just as bad as people outside do? Okay? So, the thing is, is where are you at? How much of your heart have you given to Jesus Christ? How many people, I love this, when you go and you see that the lottery jackpot is $1.4 billion. That's a B. You gotta love this. How many old people you see in there that they just cash their social security checks and that's the first place they go? Because that's their retirement plan. Hey, let's face it, if you didn't have one, then that may be the best one you got to look forward to. Unless you trust in a higher power. Amen. Right? Yeah. Will God supply half of your need? If you give God half of your heart, do you think He's going to supply all your need? If you give God a quarter of your heart, so all your needs, are they being a quarter supplied, a half supplied, or all supplied? Well, ask yourself, how much of your heart are you giving to Him? Think about that. Now listen. My wife was privileged to be with her mother and, and see her mother move down here to Florida. To spend time with her here. And then she moved back up north and she got really sick. And so her sister took care of her then. And she got to a certain point where my wife went up there and spent time with her. And because she wasn't with her every day, she could see that she was towards the end of her life. It, it was coming. And her sister couldn't see it. Her sister was with her every day. And, and they had to have some very hard conversations about what's best, what needs to be done. Brothers and sisters, everyone here is going to face that decision. Either for somebody you love, or somebody who will be making those decisions for you. Be good to your people. <laughs> be kind to those who are around you. Those hard decisions to make. But when that time comes, don't you want somebody to make those decisions who loves you? Amen. 
Don't you want somebody who will actually look out for your best interests? Who is not caring about themselves but cares about you? That's what Jesus Christ has done for you. He has sacrificed everything he had and he was so that you can be with him. He made the decision of what's going to happen to you at the point of death. Whether you live or whether you die. Whether you're with him for eternity or whether eternity forgets you even ever lived. <coughs> Won't there come a point when God will wipe away all tears Amen. and the former things will be forgotten? Amen. If you're not there, they'll never remember you lived. Everything that you built, everything that you've done, this name that you try to create will be gone and it'll be gone forever. There'll be no more Kardashians on your No more reality TV. No more stupidity. making itself to be something great, there will be love. There will be kindness. There will be harmony throughout all of God's universe. That when you breathe, you will breathe in and out this harmony. You will breathe in and out this peace, and you will breathe in and out this love. Because it emanates from God Himself. Do you not want that? Isn't that better than anything that this world has to offer you? Amen. Then why do we sell ourselves so cheap? Why do we yawn and get bored with it? Uh, well, you know, if it was to happen tomorrow, that'd be great, but you know, I've still got a long time to live, and so, you know, I I'm here, and that's there. What Jesus came to tell you is that you can have that here. Amen. Do you know why? Because if you accept Christ, who dwells in your heart? Jesus. Through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, right? And so what all heaven has to offer you is given to you now. Like my wife, I too got to be with my mother when she was sick and went through cancer. Cancer is a horrible disease. It changes people. It changes their appearance. It saps their strength. <laughs> My mother used to be a woman of iron. You didn't want to get her upset. You didn't want to get her mad. And you could see in her face, if you got her mad, that it wasn't going to be a good thing. But my mother had compassion. My mother had compassion greater than any human being I've ever met. All my friends love my mother. They love to be around her. They have respect for her because she had true compassion and love. Unless she got her upset. Then, but you know, Christ took care of that. Christ took care of that. When my mother got sick and she had to hear and face the fact that this was terminal and that only a miracle was going to change the outcome of this. At a certain point, she had to get comfortable with the fact that this was it. She was going to die. Okay? She had to make peace with that. She had to have all those questions. Why me? Why is this happening to me? God, where are you? When you're alone in the middle of the night, and you don't feel good, your body's racked with pain, and you wonder where your God is. What she found out, is that God was with her the whole time. She did not lose her faith. Now, she had questions. But once that she didn't find an answer to, you know what? She didn't need it because she accepted Jesus Christ as her Lord and her Savior. And that she knew that if she closed her eyes in this life, it wasn't the end. And that when Jesus came back, it would be the beginning of an eternity <laughs> of no more pain or sickness or death. Amen. Amen. Remember at the funeral, and I did her funeral. That's a strange thing. Yeah. 
I had to take her down to this funeral home and we had to pick out the place where they would put her ashes. That was a strange day as well. But it had to be done. Tough decisions. How do you deal?